This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.blogsome.com. Today's reading is by Dale Hujic of SpunWithTears.com. The name of the book is Childhood by Leo Tolstoy, Chapter 7 through 9. Chapter 7 The Hunt. At the head of the cavalcade rode Turka on a hog back roan. On his head he wore a shaggy cap, while with a magnificent horn slung across his shoulders and a knife at his belt, he looked so cruel and exorable that one would have thought that he was going to engage in bloody strife with his fellow man, rather than to hunt a small animal. Around the hind legs of his horse, the hounds gambled like a cluster of checkered restless balls. If one of them wished to stop, it was only with the greatest difficulty that it could do so, since not only had its leash fellow also to be induced to halt, but at once one of the huntsmen would wheel around, crack his whip, and shout to the delinquent, Back to the pack there. Arrived at a gate, Papa told us and the huntsman to continue our way along the road, and then rode off across a cornfield. The harvest was at its height. On the further side of a large, shining yellow stretch of cornland lay a high, purple belt of forest, which I always figured in my eyes as a distant, mysterious region, behind which either the world ended or an uninhabited waste began. This expanse of cornland was dotted with swaths and reapers, while along the lanes where the sickle had passed could be seen the backs of women as they stooped among the tall, thick grain or lifted armfuls of corn and rested them against the shocks. In one corner a woman was bending over a cradle, and the whole stubble was studded with sheaves and cornflowers. In another direction, shirt-sleeved men were standing on wagons, shaking the soil from their stalks of sheaves and stacking them for carrying. As soon as the foreman, dressed in a blouse and high boots and carrying a tally stick, caught sight of Papa, he hastened to take off his lamb's wool cap and, wiping his red head, told the woman to get up. Papa's chestnut horse went trotting along with a prancing gait as it tossed its head and swished its tail to and fro to drive away the gadflies and countless other insects which tormented its flanks, while two greyhounds, their tails curved like sickles, went springing gracefully over the stubble. Milka was always first, but every now and then she would halt with a shake of her head to wait the whipper in. The chatter of the peasants, the rumbling of the horses and wagons, the joyous cries of quails, the hum of insects as they hung suspended in the motionless air, the smell of the soil and grain and steam from our horses, and the thousand different lights and shadows which the burning sun cast upon the yellowish-white cornland, and the purple forest in the distance, the white gossamer threads which were floating in the air, resting on the soil, all of these things I observed and heard and felt to the core. Arrived at the Colonova wood, we found the carriage awaiting us there, with, beside it, one horse wagonette driven by the butler, a wagonette in which there were a tea urn, some apparatus for making ices, and many other attractive boxes and bundles, all packed in straw. There was no mistaking these signs, for they meant that we were going to have tea, fruit, and ices in the open air. This afforded us intense delight, since to drink tea in a wood and on the grass, and where none else had ever drunk tea before, seemed to us a treat beyond expressing. When Turka arrived at the little clearing where the carriage was halted, he took Papa's detailed instructions as to how we were to divide ourselves and where each of us was to go, though, as a matter of fact, he never acted according to such instructions, but always followed his own devices. Then he unleashed the hounds, fastened the leashes to his saddle, whistled to the pack, and disappeared among the young birch trees, the liberated hounds jumping about him in high delight, wagging their tails, and sniffing and gambling with each other as they dispersed themselves in different directions. "'Has any one a pocket-handkerchief to spare?' asked Papa. I took mine from my pocket and offered it to him. "'Very well. Fasten it to this greyhound here.' "'Gizana?' I asked, with the air of a connoisseur. "'Yes. Then run him along the road with you. When you come to a little clearing in the woods, stop and look about you, and don't come back to me without a hair.' Accordingly, I tied my handkerchief around Gizana's soft neck, 
and set it running at full speed toward the appointed spot, Papa laughing as he shouted after me, Hurry up, hurry up, or you'll be late. Every now and then Gizana kept stopping, pricking up his ears and listening to the howling of the beaters. Whenever he did this, I was not strong enough to move him, and could do no more than shout, Come on, come on! Presently he set off so fast that I could not restrain him, and I encountered more than one fall before we reached our destination. Selecting there a level, shady spot near the roots of a great oak tree, I lay down on the turf, making Gazana crouch beside me, and waited. As usual, my imagination far outstripped reality. I fancied that I was pursuing at least my third hare, when, as a matter of fact, the first hound was only just giving tongue. Presently, however, Turka's voice began to sound through the wood in a louder and more excited tones. The baying of a hound came nearer and nearer, and then another, and then a third, and then a fourth. Deep Throat joined in the rising and falling cadences of a chorus, until the whole had united their voices in one continuous, tumultuous burst of melody. As the Russian proverb expresses it, the forest had found the tongue, and the hounds were burning as with fire. My excitement was so great that I nearly swooned where I stood. My lips parted themselves as though smiling. The perspiration poured from me in streams, and in spite of the tickling sensation caused by the drops as they trickled over my chin, I never thought of wiping them away. I felt that a crisis was approaching, yet the tension was too unnatural to last. Soon the hounds came tearing along the edge of the wood, and then, behold, they were racing away from me again and the, of hares there was not a sign to be seen. I looked in every direction, and Gizana did the same, pulling at his leash at first and whining. He then lay down again by my side, rested his muzzle on my knees, and resigned himself to disappointment. Among the naked roots of the oak tree under which I was sitting, I could see countless ants swarming over the parched gray earth, and winding among the acorns, withered oak leaves, dry twigs, russet moss, and slender, scanty blades of grass. And serried files they kept pressing forward on the level track they had made for themselves, some carrying burdens, some not. I took a piece of twig and barred their way. Instantly it was curious to see how they made light of the obstacle. Some got past it by creeping underneath, and some by climbing over it. A few, however, there were, especially those weighted with loads, who were nonplussed by what to do. They either halted and searched for a way around, or returned whence they had come, or climbed the adjacent herbage, with the evident intention of reaching my hand and going up the sleeve of my jacket. From this interesting spectacle my attention was distracted by the yellow wings of a butterfly which was fluttering alluringly before me. Yet I had scarcely noticed it before it flew away to a little distance, and circling over some half-faded blossoms of white clover, settled on one of them. Whether it was the sun's warmth that delighted it, or whether it was busy sucking nectar from the flower, at all events it seemed thoroughly comfortable. It scarcely moved its wings at all, and pressed itself down into the clover until I could hardly see its body. I sat with my chin on my hands and watched it with intense interest. Suddenly Gizana sprung up and gave me such a violent jerk that I nearly rolled over. I looked around. At the edge of the wood, a hare had just come into view, with one ear bent down and the other one sharply pricked. The blood rushed to my head, and I forgot everything else as I shouted slipped the dog, and rushed towards the spot. Yet all was in vain. The hare stopped, made a rush, and was lost to view. How confused I felt, when at the moment Turka stepped from the undergrowth, he had been following the hounds as they ran along the edges of the wood. He had seen my mistake, which had consisted in my not biding my time, and now threw me a contemptuous look, as he said, Ah, master! And you should have heard the tone in which he had said it. It would have been a relief to me if he had then and there suspended me to his saddle instead of the hare. For a while I could only stand miserably where I was, without attempting to recall the dog and ejaculate as I slapped my knees, Good heavens, what a fool I was! I could hear the hounds retreating into the distance and baying along the further side of the wood as they pursued the hare. 
while Turka rallied them with blasts on his gorgeous horn, and yet I did not stir. Chapter 8. We Play Games The hunt was over, a cloth had been spread in the shade of some young birch trees, and the whole party was disposed around it. The butler, Gabriel, had stamped down the surrounding grass, wiped the plates in readiness, and unpacked from a basket a quantity of plums and peaches wrapped in leaves. Through the green branches of the young birch trees the sun glittered and threw little glancing balls of light upon the pattern of my napkin, my legs, and the bald, moist head of Gabriel. A soft breeze played in the leaves of the trees above us, and breathing softly upon my hair and heated face, refreshed me beyond measure. When we had finished the fruit and ices, nothing remained to be done around the empty cloth. So despite the oblique, scorching rays of the sun, we rose and proceeded to play. "'Well, what should it be?' said Lobotchka, blinking in the sunlight and skipping about the grass. "'Suppose we play Robinson.' "'No, that's a tiresome game,' objected Woloda, stretching himself lazily on the turf and gnawing some leaves. "'Always Robinson. If you want to play at something, play at building a summer house.' Woloda was giving himself tremendous airs. Probably he was proud of having ridden the hunter, and so pretended to be very tired. Perhaps, also, he had too much hard-headedness and too little imagination to fully enjoy the game of Robinson. It was a game which consisted of performing various scenes from the Swiss family Robinson, a book which we had recently been reading. "'Well, but be a good boy. Why not try and please us this time?' the girls answered. "'You may be Charles or Ernest or the father, whichever you like best,' added Katenka, as she tried to raise him from the ground by pulling at his sleeve. "'No, I'm not going to. It's a tiresome game,' said Woloda again, though smiling as if secretly pleased. "'It would be better to sit at home than to not play anything.' muttered Laboshka. With tears in her eyes, she was a great weeper. Well, go on, then. Only don't cry. I can't stand that sort of thing. Woloda's condescension did not please us much. On the contrary, his lazy, tired expression took away all the fun of the game. When we sat on the ground and imagined that we were sitting in a boat, and either fishing or rowing with all our might, Woloda persisted in sitting with folded hands or in anything but a fisherman's posture. I made a remark about it, but he replied that, whether we moved our hands or not, we should neither gain nor lose ground, certainly not advance at all, and I was forced to agree with him, again when I pretended to go out hunting, and with a stick over my shoulder set off into the wood. Woloda only lay down on his back with his hands under his head, and said that he supposed that it was all the same, whether he went or not. Such behavior and speeches cooled our ardor for the game, and were very disagreeable. More so, since it was impossible not to confess to oneself that Woloda was right, I myself knew that it was not only impossible to kill birds with a stick, but to shoot at all with such a weapon. Yet it was the game, and if we were at once to begin reasoning thus, it would become equally impossible for us to go for drives on chairs. I think that even Woloda himself cannot at that moment have forgotten how, in the long winter evenings, we had been used to cover an armchair with a shawl and make a carriage of it, one of us being the coachman, the other one the footman, and the two girls the passengers, and the three other chairs the trio of horses abreast, with what ceremony we used to set out, and with what adventures we used to meet on the way. How gaily! and quickly those long winter evenings used to pass. If we were always to judge from reality, games would be nonsense, but if games were nonsense, what else would there be left to do? Chapter 9. A First Essay in Love Pretending to gather some American fruit from a tree, Lobotchka suddenly plucked a leaf upon which was a huge caterpillar, and throwing the insect with horror to the ground, lifted her hands, and sprung away as though afraid it would spit at her. The game stopped, and we crowded our heads together as we stooped to look at the curiosity. I peeped over Katenka's shoulder as she was trying to lift the caterpillar by placing another leaf in its way. 
I had observed before that the girls had a way of shrugging their shoulders whenever they were trying to put a loose garment straight on their bare necks, as well as that Mimi always grew angry on witnessing this maneuver and declared it to be a chambermaid's trick. As Katenka bent over the caterpillar, she made that very movement, while at the same instant the breeze lifted the fichu on her white neck. Her shoulder was close to my lips. I looked at it and kissed it. She did not turn round, but Woloda remarked without raising his head, What spooniness! I felt the tears rising to my eyes. I could not take my gaze from Katenka. I had long been used to her fair, fresh face, and always been fond of her. But now I looked at her more closely, and felt more fond of her than I had ever done or felt before. When we returned to our grown-ups, Papa informed us, to our great joy, that at Mamma's entreaties our departure was to be postponed until the following morning. We rode home beside the carriage, Woloda and I galloping near it, and vying with one another in our exhibition of horsemanship and daring. My shadow looked longer now than it had done before, and from that I judged that I had grown into a fine rider yet my complacency was soon marred by an unfortunate occurrence. Desiring to outdo Woloda before the audience in the carriage, I dropped a little behind. Then with a whip and spur I urged my steed forward, and at the same time assumed a natural, graceful attitude, with the attention of wooding past the carriage on the side on which Katenka was seated. My only doubt was whether to halloo or not, as I did so. In the event, my infernal horse stopped so abruptly, when just level with the carriage horses, that I was pitched forward onto its neck and cut a very sorry figure. End of chapter 9